Alright, so I watched this video, I watched this debate, Ben Watkins versus Kyle on philosophy of mind. Now, I, you've heard me reference the philosophical atheists. Ben Watkins himself is the gold standard of philosophical atheists for uh, behavior, A. Quality of his argumentation, A. Nuanced thought, A. Solid A's all around in almost every area I can think of. And if you watch, he is also the embodiment of the tension between him and the debate me bro clowns. Go look at his timeline. Last week, for example, he got he's he's the living embodiment of the tension between the, the goofball dog, dogmatic idealistic atheists, the dogmatic ideologues, I call them the debate me bro clowns, and the philosophical atheists. Why? They want him to shut up. <laughs> they don't want him. He's capable of nuanced thought. He has enough in intellectual integrity to be constantly pointing out his nuanced thought, and they want to shut him up. So, for example, last, last week he pointed out the obvious. He said something along the lines of argumentation is a form of evidence. And he got all this pushback from the debate me bro clowns. These are the same people who say, science, 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 don't know how science works. They basically told him, no, empirical verification is the only type of evidence. I told you, two ten poles. Two ten poles to the most of the 80% of the people in the atheist community. And they're both being shattered. Scientism and materialism. Materialism was shattered in 1920. Promise. I will explain that clearly in the video ahead. But, so they tell him, these are the same people that go, science, 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 apparently have no idea how science actually works. Don't read science books, don't read the history of science. Almost every theory in science that I can think of started out as what? Theory first, an argument. <laughs> I just swear to God, they're telling him, no, it's only empiricism. I don't know what, the, what on earth they think people are empirically verifying for. They just guess. <laughs> they, they, almost every single scientific theory starts out as theory first, an argument, and then somebody prior to investigation usually comes up with the counter-argument. And they hash it out ahead of time prior to investigating anything, before they go looking, especially if you're talking about high-level physics. Why? Because by the time you're building something like a Hayden Collider or whatever it's called, Super Collider, those things cost a lot of money to build. They aren't speculating when they build it. They're pretty much building it to verify what they kind of think they already know is there. To just, you know, solidify what they're pretty sure they're going to find. Because they've hashed it out. I'll give you the perfect one that's going on right now. There was a debate uh, that I don't really understand all that well to speak off of clearly yet, but, you know, I will soon. Between relativity, there's a discrepancy between relativity and quantum mechanics. They don't quite add up together. So along comes a theory, superstring theory, okay? It looks like super string theory is not going to carry the day. I don't really know the details of the super strings and like the big super strings and somehow it reconciles relativity to quantum mechanics. Not exactly sure how, but I won't have to know how. Why? Because it looks like it's being argued out of existence before, it even, before they even get to the point where they're going to investigate empirically. It looks like it's being argued off of the table before they're even going to empirically investigate it for. I don't know that much about it. Probably Jeffrey does. He probably fill you on the details. I don't really understand the details between relativity and quantum mechanics. I will soon, but I don't yet. There's some sort of discrepancy and a theory that reconciles the two. That theory is going to be argued off the table prior to investigation. So all the people arguing with Ben Watkins don't know what they're talking about. They say science, science, science all day long. They don't even read science. They don't even know how science works. Almost every scientific theory starts out as an argument, and then a counter-argument, and then a series of counter-arguments prior to any empirical investigation whatsoever. So, like I said, at the end of the day, there's only going to be one type of atheist left standing in the space, the philosophical atheist. The top shelf atheists, your Shannon Q's, your Paul Gia's, your Vice Rhinos, will become philosophical atheists. Why? There's no other choice. The only question is who will be there first. My, my guess is Shannon. That's my guess. Why? Because she already sometimes is. And she may be the smartest. She may be the smartest. 
It's true. She might be the smartest. I understand if you're wincing, you say, well, she's really wrong about philosophy of mind. She's getting something basically wrong there. I understand that. But that doesn't, sometimes there's a paradox here. Sometimes the more intelligent person a person is, the harder it is to get them when they're on a train of thought that is wrong, the harder it is to get them to see it. Why? Because they can come up with a lot of convenient, like, she can fire off a lot of, I don't know, <laughs> she, she can talk really quickly. It's the same thing that goes on with T. Jump. To, you know, some people wince, wince because they don't think he's as smart as he is. He's really, really sharp. He does the same thing. He makes some basic errors. The one guy with philosophy of logic I was trying to teach him. I don't want to sidetrack into this, so I'll just say this briefly. Dr. Richard Brown, who is a teacher of logic and philosophy, was trying to correct him on a basic error that he's been doing for like two or three years. It's really hard for him to see the basic error. Why? Because when he's in a debate, he's really good at maneuvering. Shannon and T-Jump are sort of similar to me. They're talkers. The problem when you're a talker is you can talk yourself into being wrong and never know you're wrong because you can just talk, 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 talk. So, yes, she's making a basic error in philosophy of mind that's pretty basic. Doesn't mean she isn't one of the sharpest in town. She's still one of the sharpest in town, and she's already started trying to become a philosophical atheist. My guess is why she stopped and drew back is because she got pushed back from her squad. I know this for a fact because I saw this with my own eyes. Okay, she had Joe Schmidt on her channel. Joe Schmidt is so good at Steel Man in the Christian position that when he was on her channel, a lot of her audience, some of whom are total debate me bro clown idiots, they're cool people in her audience, generally the moderators, Critical Cripple is one of the guys I like. There's a bunch of people on there who are, I like, who are regulars. And then there's a bunch of debate me bro clowns who show up who are a pack of idiots. Okay? Generally the moderators are all cool. <laughs> I'm a moderator, but I know that for a fact, but I'm a moderator. <laughs> We're all cool. <laughs> Every, there's a whole bunch of people who were grumbling because she was talking to Joe Schmidt and they were basically like, who's this Christian guy? They don't want nuanced thought. Period. If you start using nuanced thought, if you start thinking, wait, religion is really intelligent instead of dumb, they say religion's dumb. Okay, that's a dumb point of view. If you start thinking, wow, religion is really intelligent and exploring it in a nuanced way, they push back on you. Why? They don't want you to do it. So I think she started, you know, listening to her audience. Don't listen to your audience, Shannon. Listen to your intellect. I think, I don't know for a fact that she's one of the sharpest ones of, that, of them, but I suspect that she is. Why, she talks really fast. She can talk really fast and throw out a lot of complicated things. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I just favor that because I can do the same thing. I don't know. I think, my, so my money is on her or Paul Gia. Paul Gia because he has a lot of integrity. Bang, again, people are, what are you talking about? <laughs> Apology, you got, if you're on the Christian squad, you gotta think, you got to reason this across squads. The only crime that he does, and it's not a big deal, is <laughs> everyone complains that he makes cartoon pictures of himself. Who cares? <laughs> I don't know, everyone gets tripped out about that. Paul G, I I don't care at all that you make yourself a cartoon. And I, I didn't even notice that he was making himself muscly and other guys small. I'm complaining about that. Yeah, that's a big deal, guys. Okay, on my squad, grow up a little too. <laughs> or go home. <laughs> Nobody cares. The other thing that they ding him on is like, this is true, but this is kind of a big so what. He makes these really weird cryptic tweets every two or three days and you have no idea what he's talking about. I agree with those. Those scripted tweets don't make any sense to me either, but that's not really a big deal. When he was accused of having no integrity, when he was accused of, like, basically deliberately misrepresenting on purpose, I didn't even bother to check, guys. I didn't even bother to check on the controversy. Well, I was almost positive he didn't do it. I was almost positive he didn't do it. Why? Because I know for a fact that he has integrity. That's why he was on my channel. It cost him something to deconvert. He said that in his testimony. I believe that. He knew it was going to cost him something. He knew it. He knew it was going to cost him friends and family and like a lot. But he did it anyways. And I'm not saying deconversion is right. But some of the things that he reasoned as true were true. We all understand this, correct? We're not defending <laughs> the church is 6,000 years old. And we're not, we're not, we understand that some of the deconstruction that he deconstructed was correct and he was intuiting correctly and it was the truth. Okay, it cost him something to do that, I promise. He's not making that up. I heard that out of his own mouth. I believe that. That's the truth. So, my money, anyway, it's irrelevant. My money is on those two to convert to full philosophical atheists first. If you are an atheist listening to me and you want to get up to speed, 
Here are the channels you can watch. Ben Watkins, Emerson Green. Emerson Green, you can watch almost every video he's done. I think I've watched almost every video he's done. He understands the depth of materialism really well. He understands philosophy of mind, hard problem of consciousness really well. He's even got videos on Schopenhauer, the right person to be talking about. Um, Crusade Against Ignorance, he's an agnostic, majesty of reason, and I don't know this for a fact because I haven't started watching Answers and Reason videos, but I'm almost positive they're all, I can sign off on everything they do, they're on the right page. Almost positive. Don't know that for a fact because I haven't watched. Don't got time to watch everything, you know, what do you want? Pretty sure they're on the right page. I can kind of tell from how they are when I interact with them. The Phil Bueller guy I know pretty well, positive he's on the right page, so I'm pretty sure they're on the right page. Nuanced thought. This debate between, uh, getting back to the issue at hand, the debate between Ben Watkins and Kyle. Uh, uh, honestly, they are both right to some degree, and they are both wrong to some degree, and the difference is really, really, really like, you know, parsing out really, really specific, minute, precise things in between. So, for example, um... I guess Ben Watkins is calling himself a materialist, but then he's kind of got other ideas. It's really hard to say, but he, in the middle of this, he defended the materialist position as well as it can possibly be defended. He said something along the lines of, you know, there is a, I believe that there is a real material world independent of human beings that exists, and we can know its functions and its properties, and we can measure and detect for it, and and it obeys rules and laws like that. Okay, perfectly reasonable position. You are also happen to be wrong. <laughs> wrong. <-y. laughs> he is talking about the hard problem of consciousness. Okay, and I'll get into Kyle's points in a minute. Let me start with Kyle's points. Kyle made two really strong points that are really important. One, he separates at the beginning. He goes back to Cartesian dualism, where we separated mind and matter. Another way of saying it is we separated mind, st the world of stuff, and what it is like to be something. And they are now starting to come back together. And then he talked about what he called the power of positive properties. I forget what the exact word for it is. The something of positive properties. Materialism states, according to pure materialism, you should be able to reduce something to the sum of its contingent parts, you should be able to reduce it to strictly its physical properties, and that would be the only story that ever need be told about that thing, and you'd understand everything about it. And we know for a fact that isn't true. There's a lot of thought things, like Mary's room and such. We know, like for an example, an apple, if you reduce it to, the, to just its physical parts, it's never going to tell you what the apple actually tastes like. Period. That is irreconcilable to some degree with materialism, and you cannot eliminate that fact. Why? Because it's a fact. Now, Ben Watkins said there is a real material world that functions and has properties and it exists independent of human thought. All perfectly reasonable materials position. False. <laughs> totally false. The hard problem of consciousness is a challenge to materialism. The measurement problem in physics decimated materialism in 1920. I promise. No less than Albert Einstein himself, the greatest scientist of all time, took Ben Watkins' position. Why? Because it made sense to him. Of course there is a real material world. This is what we study morning, noon, and night. This is what we run data on. You, uh, you heat it up, it does this. You learn things about its properties. So he got really tripped out by the implications of quantum mechanics, which were really obvious in 1920. And he had a famous series of debates with Niels Bohr and basically yielded the territory, gave up. So the greatest scientist of all time took Ben Watkins' position, materialist position, and decided it can't be. Why? Because it can't be. It's false. The real material world. Now the question is to what degree? So that's why you've got to listen carefully and there's no room at the table for the baby bro clowns. Why? I'm not using all that precise language, but I need to. Why? Because the question is to what degree? The real material world to some degree isn't actually there, or at least not there in the way we understand it. And how I said this the first time, I'll find a better way to say this so that it's clear. If the choice is binary between materialism and idealism, idealism wins hands down. The choice isn't necessarily binary. 
and the real material does exist, kind of, sort of, <laughs> kind of, sort of, <laughs> and have actual properties. The question is, to what degree? The question is, to what degree? Because according to the physics, and memorize this, guys, write this on your wall. This is going to say this a thousand times. Physics don't lie. The physics don't lie. The physics don't lie. That's why Albert Einstein yielded the ground, even though it bothered him so much. He's a materialist, after all. That's what these guys are trained in morning, noon, and night. Scientists can be forgiven for being materialists. Why? Because they're ideologically committed to it. It's what they are taught from day one. Run the facts. Run the facts. Empirical data. Empirical data. The data. What does the data suggest? The way, when the, the, the implications were there right from the start with quantum mechanics. Right from the start with quantum mechanics. By the way, just a little fun aside, it's not some mysterious coincidence that Schrodinger himself, of the famous of the Schrodinger equation, I swear to God this is true, I swear to God this is true, study, drumroll please, Vedanta Hinduism. <laughs> Why is that funny? Uh, if you haven't listened to some of my last videos, you go all the way back 2,000 years in time. The original idealists were the Vedanta Hindus. They went into their little prayer closets, they did their rituals, or maybe they just understood by sheer intuition, and they came to a conclusion, theological in nature, I guess, but it turned out to be true, that the real material world both is and isn't there. Both is and isn't there. It's not some mysterious coincidence that Schrodinger himself studied Hinduism, Vedanta <laughs> Hinduism, I swear to God that's true. I swear to God that's true. And just a word to the debate bro clowns that are squaring off against poor Ben Watkins. Yeah, poor Ben Watkins, they're persecuting him. Okay, these are the same guys who say philosophy, philosophy, it's all science, 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 philosophy. The greatest physicist alive today, thus the greatest scientist alive today, said, quote, we need philosophy. We need philosophy to do what? To make sense of the data. Why? Because quantum mechanics don't make any sense. <laughs> don't make any sense at all. And we can't understand it. We need a philosophy. Some type of interpretive framework so we can make sense of the implications of quantum mechanics. The, the implications are there right from the start, guys, I promise. They knew materialism was dead in 1920. Einstein himself defended the position and eventually yielded to Niels Bohr. Why? Because it's indefensible. To some degree, the real material world has no standalone ontology. It only exists relationally. Uh, so, kick the conversation up the food chain for just a bit. In quantum mechanics, there are two tent poles. The, either, the interpretations either lean towards idealism or they lean towards materialism. Why? Because the actual implications of the data are pretty obvious. The real material world, to some degree, both is and isn't there. It's a paradox. How can that be true, Craig? That's why it trips everybody out. It's really hard to wrap your brain around, but that is the fact, and the physics don't lie. The real material world, to some degree, both is and isn't there. Enter relational quantum mechanics. That is the, the school, the interpretation that Carlo Rovelli favors. I predict that within five years, that will be the dominant, that will be the dominant interpretation of quantum mechanics. Why? Because it reconciles those facts to the best of his ability. It is both realism and anti-realism in equal measures. But it is somewhat anti-realism, Ben. Do you understand? Materialism is dead. Materialism totally depends on material, material itself being the ontological primitive. That cannot now nor ever be. Why? It is logically inconsistent with itself. More important than the hard problem of consciousness is the measuring problem of physics. The hard problem of consciousness is a really good challenge to materialism. The measurement problem in physics decimated materialism a hundred years ago. And Einstein himself tried to defend materialism and couldn't. Why? Because the physics don't freaking lie. The physics don't lie. The physics don't lie. The real material world, to some degree, both is and isn't there. That's according to the physics, period. That's why it trips everybody out. Now, there is going to be an answer. And it has to do with space-time and sequences and things like that. Um, but not to get too complicated here. So, the question is... Both Kyle and Ben are kind of, sort of right. The question is to what degree? The question is to what degree?
Carlo Rovelli himself has tried to process, and he said this his own words, process idealism entirely out of the picture with his relational school of quantum mechanics. Take this with a grain of salt because I'm not a physicist, but I'm almost positive. I know for a fact that's going to be the dominant school within five years, relational school of quantum mechanics. Why? It's the only one that reconciles both, both tent poles. The real world both is and isn't there. It only exists relationally. That's the key. Relationally. Relationally. That's the key. Relative to other fixed entities, relative to other properties. Has no standalone ontology. That's complicated and hard to wrap your brain around. Welcome to quantum mechanics. It's hard to understand. Period. Period. If you're not struggling to understand it, you're not doing it right. And you can't fake it. You can't fake it. You can't fake it. That's why you can't say, go, oh, my God, I can't believe he said this, because I'll see through it right away. There's no way you can fake it. You're either struggling to understand it, and the, what we are talking about is really fine-tuned nuances, okay, that you either, what, what we are talking about between Ben and Kyle is a high-level chess game where the facts are almost indisputable, and they should be known by both parties and readily assented to by both parties. What we are only doing is discussing with precision and detail the nuanced in-betweens. That's why I said, philosophical atheists is going to be the only one standing at the end of the day. Why? Wow, they're the only ones capable of this. And they have enough int intellectual integrity to do it. That's also key. So, uh, let's, let's, let's go back to one that I've used a hundred times, but I really think it's illustrative. Kyle is essentially correct to one degree. To what degree, though? You cannot eliminate the perceiver. You cannot eliminate the perceiver from the set of material facts. So we take our photograph. This one illustrates pretty well. A photograph according to, uh, uh, according to the material components of a photograph, what is it? It is pixels. The materialist is telling you that's the only story about the photograph. What is comprised of materially? Pixels. Okay, the idealist understands that, and most people normally understand that you're looking at a photograph for a particular reason. And it isn't because of the pixels. It's because of the screen, what is represented by the photograph on the screen of perception. Mommy, Daddy, Little Junior. What's the picture of? Mommy, Daddy, and Little Junior. So what you are perceiving in the photograph is a really important part of the story. One part of the story is what, what the photograph is comprised of materially. Pixels. Another part of the story is what is represented by the photograph and what is perceived. Take that to the real material world and try and explain how idealism is both true, the real material world both exists and does not exist at the exact same time. So going back to Myth Vision for a minute. Myth Vision asked our resident metaphysical idealist the correct question. Wait a minute. There is a, there is a table in my uh, living room. It's there when I go to bed at night. It's there when I wake up in the morning. It's there. It exists. It has standalone ontology. Not so fast there, cowboy. Only kind of sort of. Think of it this way. First of all, look at the table in front of you. There's a table in front of you. Okay? We know for a fact, for a fact that you are representing it back to yourself as what? Solid matter. Correct? Okay, we know for a fact it isn't solid matter. At the subatomic level, it is electrons in motion. So you are representing it back to yourself in a way that is a convenient fiction, but ultimately not true. Try and think of the real material world, all of it, the same way. Why? Because you've been perceiving it inaccurately, to some degree, your entire life. Do you understand? Think, look at the table in front of you. It only looks to you like solid matter, right? Can you perceive it as electron in motion at all? No, you can't. But we know for a fact that it is electrons in motion. It isn't solid. It's electrons in motion. Okay. The only thing you can perceive it as is solid matter. The, the, the physics don't lie, guys. Einstein yielded the territory, guys. Einstein, the greatest scientist of all time, gave up on trying to defend materialism very quickly <laughs> between with a series of letters between him and Niels Bohr. Materialism died in a hundred years ago. Why? Because the table in front of you doesn't necessarily have standalone ontology. Yes, that's how you perceive it, but you're already, I already pointed out that you're perceiving it inaccurately in an important way. You perceive it as solid, right? It isn't solid. 
So there are other important ways that you are perceiving it that are hard to wrap your brain around, but yet in fact true. This is basically like we are on the verge of a new Copernican revolution, Copernicus revolution. Try and imagine trying to explain to someone in 1600 that the earth revolved around the sun. When I, I don't even know, when did they figure out that the earth revolved around the sun? When did they figure that out? I have no idea. 16 something or other? 16 something or other, a long time ago. Try and wrap your, try and be just an everyday person and some scientist knows for a fact that the earth revolves around the sun. Try and figure you listening to that guy explain to you. Are you ever going to believe him? No, of course not. Why? It doesn't make any sense to you. The only reason it makes sense to us now is we've had some training in perceiving it. We went to school, they showed us maps of the galaxy, they showed us, you know, a sun and planets revolving around it, so we can make cogent sense of the idea. It's just like looking at the table in front of you. We can't perceive that as electron in motion. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to us that way. But it is in fact electrons in motion. That's why the other important breakthrough are the German idealists. Going back to Kant, the phenomena nomena distinction. There is the phenomena, how we experience things, and then what is actually going on. And the more important German idealist, Schopenhauer. Will and representation. We re-represent the world back to ourselves. Now, the physics don't lie. To some degree, the real material world both is and isn't there. So, let's take a look at our table again. Let me ask you an important question about the table. And keep in mind, this is a trick question. Where is that table? It's right in front of me, Craig. Aha, I knew he was stupid. It's right in front of me, idiot. Where is it? It's right in front of me. Okay, that's not where it is. That's where it is in relation to you. Bang! Gotcha. Got all of you. That isn't where it in fact is. That is where it is in relation to you. That's why I kicked it up the food chain to relational school of quantum mechanics. Relational school of quantum mechanics says that there's a fixed set of properties that exist in relationship to others' fixed set of properties. And he's processed the idealism out of it. Pretty sure he's going to have to put the idealism back into it to tweak it. In other words, the table doesn't exist, doesn't have a location. Where is it, objectively speaking, where is that table? Nowhere? Everywhere? The question doesn't even make sense. It can't be answered. Where is that table, objectively speaking? It is particles and motions floating through space in relationship to other particles and motions floating through space. That's what the physics said. And the physics are correct. The physics don't lie. Where is it? It's a meaningless question. It's a question, it's a question in relationship to you. It's right in front of your face. But that's in relation to you. Enter idealism. You see what I'm saying? I admit I kind of said that. <laughs> no, I don't see what you're saying. I kind of said that poorly. But it doesn't matter. Another video is coming down tomorrow, and I'll clarify this. Clarification is the whole point. There's nothing to debate. There's clear understanding. To some degree, material, the real material world exists. It's to what degree? Idealism is correct. To what degree? There may be a nuanced in-between position that comes up. For the time being, idealism is the only game in town. There may be something that comes up in, in the future called like neo-idealism or neo-material something that reconciles the fact that the real material world does exist but only in relation to the perceiver and the perceiver can never be removed from the equation. The perceiver is there. The, the, uh, consciousness itself can be the ontological primitive. Materialism cannot now nor ever be. And there's almost no such thing as material reality that exists outside of perception or consciousness. Where, where, where is it? <laughs> where would it be? Ask yourself a question. Objectively speaking, where is that table? Doesn't really have an answer. Nowhere, everywhere, floating around in space. Materially speaking. In relation to other things floating around in space. When you, when you define a location, and again, this is my own perceptions, I'm not a physicist, these are my own intuitions, also has to do with time sequences, time and place. It isn't just a location, it's a location, time and place. That's when a material, where the real material world exists. Temporarily, location, time, place, as material fact. Other than that, it's for the most part phantom. You are giving it its representation. 
It is decaying as we speak. We know that for a fact. The table in front of me is decaying as we speak. We know that for a fact. Quickly. It is particles in motion. We know that for a fact. It has no real fixed location. We know that for a fact. These all according to the physics, and the physics don't lie. The physics don't lie. So you see? No. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> it's really complicated. I'm going to try and sim polish it up, simplify it in the days and weeks to come so that everyone clearly understands what I'm talking about. It's not that hard. It's complicated, but it's not impossible. It's not that hard to understand. Think of it this way. My body is walking in space. My soul is in orbit with God face to face. Floating, flipping, flying, tripping, tripping from starlight to moonbeam. It's pretty trippy stuff, guys. <laughs> pretty trippy stuff, Greg. Right? Yeah, trippy stuff. Makes sense to me, probably because I did mushrooms once upon a time way back when. It, so did Carlo Rovelli. Carlo Rovelli, by the way, is the name of the physicist that I keep mentioning. No, it's not the other name that I've been throwing out there. I don't know where I got that from. Um, I mean, there's a lot more to say. The, the, the long and the short of it is Ben Watkins and Kyle are both correct to some degree. Idealism is true, and the real material world exists within the veil of perception to some degree. And it's a question of understanding the complexities and nuances and parsing it out correctly. There's no, there's no other room but, you know, high level abstract thinking where you're trying to say, understand it precisely. Other than that, there's nothing else to be told. There's, not, there's, no other, there's nothing else being talked about that's it's even close to important. You could take everything that happened on the atheist experience, every discussion in the last 10 years, take it, flush it down the toilet. Why? Because it was irrelevant. It was irrelevant. Promise. I promise that's true. Will not stand the test of time, neither will any of the four horsemen. This that what we are talking about right now is extraordinarily important, and this conversation has already stood the test of time. The Vedanta Hindus were echoed by Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer, as I mentioned, Kant and Schopenhauer are probably the two most important philosophers outside of Plato and Aristotle. Debatable, but I would say so. When it comes to understanding this, definitely. Schopenhauer said, towards the end of his life, he, he, he started reading, I swear to God, this is true, Vedanta Hinduism, and said, hey, wait a minute, these guys are saying the exact same thing that I said. Fast forward to the dawn of the quantum era. Okay, you've heard of the Schrodinger equation. The, they knew that materialism was dead in 1920. Their first solution was just run the equations. We know the equations work. Just run the equations. That's why I say physics don't lie. Your cell phone is powered by these equations. These equations made everything that we are using technologically wide. The, the equations work. And they knew they decimated materialism then. They didn't tell you that and they didn't fully understand it. Why? Because they were ideologically committed to materialism. Materialism died then. If Einstein could have defended materialism, he would have. He couldn't. Why? It died then. The equations don't lie. The first solution was just run the equations. We don't have to wrap our brain around it. We don't have to understand it. Now we have enter Carlo Rovelli who wants to understand it. Why? Because he's a legitimate scientist, a legitimate truth seeker. Ditto for Bernardo Castro. Legitimate truth seekers want to understand just for understanding's sake. They want to know the truth just for the sake of knowing the truth. I don't know. They're weird that way. We're weird that way. There's no other way to go about this. Why? It's too complicated to do it any other way. Struggle to understand or you're doing it wrong. Period. End of discussion. There's no room at the table for a debate with broke clowns. And nor should there be. Those guys are they're wasting, they're wasting your time if you're an atheist. They're a waste of time and they're dragging the entire community and they're wasting your time and they're a bad influence on all of you. I bet you a thousand bucks Shannon, Shannon would have already been up to speed on this stuff and a fully, fully living, breathing, philosophical atheist, but she was influenced by the idiots who told her to, you know, dumb it down, be like us. That's the message from those guys. Dumb it down, be like us, religion is dumb. That's what they say, religion is dumb. Okay, greatest physicist in the entire world has turned to what? Religion. Buddhism. To what? To make sense of the data. The dumb religion, a thousand years before the physicists figured it out, figured it out. 
The debating bro clowns are telling you this as we speak. If you're an atheist, listen to me. Go look at your timeline. You're palling around with a pack of idiots. Some of you are really smart. Get the clue. The rest of those guys are idiots. They're telling you religion is dumb. Religion is not dumb. Religion, if, if you think religion is dumb, you're not really handling it correctly. You're either being dumb or dishonest. Either way, they're dragging you down and wasting your time. They're dragging you down and wasting your time. You can take every minute of the atheist experience over the last 10 years and flush it down the toilet while they were talking about almost irrelevant stuff almost constantly. Slavery in the Old Testament, who cares? <laughs> Slavery in the Old Testament, who cares? Not relevant. This is what we are talking about right now. This is what time it is, and this is really important stuff. Really important stuff. This gets resolved, and this is theist-friendly territory. We don't need to prove anything to any atheist at all. It's not what this is about. Any atheist who is here having this conversation is one of us, period. One of us, period. Not just because we like them like JB. <laughs> JB is one of us because we like them. <laughs> no, because they are, uh, they are on the page seeking the truth correctly and in the right way. And we need their assistance. We need their assistance because they're seeing things a little bit differently and that's going to make the difference. The, the vice rhinos and the, and the Shannon Q's and the Paul G's are going to become philosophical atheists. As I said, my money's on Shannon first. Why is she the smartest? She's the smartest. I think she's the smartest. I could be wrong about that. It seems to me like she's the smartest. This is for the smart kids. It's not for the idiots. <laughs> they don't understand it. And the, the, the ones that, do, that are capable of nuanced thought, you know, shame on them times a thousand why, because they're ghouls, thugs, clowns, idiots. Really bad type of idiots, capable of nuanced thought and won't use it. Dishonest thugs, clowns, dogmatic ideologues, goons. <laughs> goons, thugs, clowns, doofuses. <laughs> doofuses. So, that's the tension between Ben Watkins and the members of his tribe. They're saying to him, be dumb like us, <laughs> be idiots like us. We don't want you to have nuanced thought. Why? Because it makes religion look good. There's no way that you can avoid it. Religion is intelligent. There's just no way to avoid it. Extremely intelligent. And yes, eventually I'll polish this all up so that it goes to my Sky Fairy in particular. Right now, you know, we're just chatting. Right now, we just chatting. Eventually, I'll polish this all up. If you're, if you're, if you're Ron, if you're getting nervous, how's this gonna, how's this gonna prove our Sky Fairy, Craig? Don't worry about Ron. It's covered. Just have faith in Craig. Have faith in me. Have faith in me. Why? Because eventually I will tie this all up in a pretty little package and somehow manage to pull Jesus out of that. Somehow. <laughs> pull Jesus out. I will smuggle Jesus in somehow. Um, don't mention Jesus love you. <laughs> I don't know. How, you, how am I going to do that? I'm not sure. It's going to be really interesting though. No, I, you know, I, if I don't, I don't. I don't care. <laughs> the point is the physics don't lie, guys. The physics do not lie. What I'm telling you is the truth and nothing but the truth. When I'm firing on all five cylinders and Jeffrey is firing on all five cylinders, the basic things that we agree upon that should be indistinguishable from who's talking. Why? Because we both talk in the same thing. I won't be trying to press my, my sky fairy on him. Then it should be indistinguishable as to who is talking. Why? Because it should be, the facts are the same. Period. The philosophy is the same. Philosophy at its best, got a bad reputation, can be mapped out. It has just not used rigorous thought to train philosophers to think clearly and correctly. Rigorous thought can be applied to philosophy just like it can be applied to science that just haven't been doing it. But it can be. Remember, the physics, the, what the physics proved, the philosophers figured out a hundred years ahead of time through sheer intelligence and intuition. Kant and Schopenhauer anticipated the physics. And the religious guys got it 2,000 years ahead of them. Period. So, the people out there telling you religion is dumb are dumb. Or dishonest. Take your pick. The people out there telling you religion is dumb are dumb or dishonest. Take your pick. Doesn't matter to me which one you pick. Those are the only options. Uh, I think I'll wrap it up. Yeah, I'll wrap it up. I know. Blah, blah, blah. Rambling, rambling, rambling. All I do is ramble, Craig. <laughs> 39 minutes. Oh, sorry, I was having a good time. I didn't notice how fast time went. I don't know if this video will make it to post. This was a little bit choppy and all over the place, but it might. So, there you have it, kids. That is all for now. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.